It is that time of year, folks. Black History Month is here. And of course, we just had Martin Luther King Jr. Day, which is a federal holiday, one of 11 federal holidays, and one of only two federal holidays to be dedicated to an American historical figure. And this is so important to discuss for so many reasons, because if you look at the calendar, you'll see that the only other American historical figure to have their own day is George Washington, the man who led the Continental Army in the Revolutionary War to defeat what was at the time the greatest military force in the history of the world, the British Empire, uh, the man who was unanimously elected to be the first president of our country and whose presidency would go on to be one of the most successful and influential presidencies in the history of our country in terms of guiding future attitudes and policy, arguably the most significant man in American history. And for that, we give him one day. And then equally represented on the calendar with one day as well is Martin Luther King Jr., who was regarded as the figurehead and martyr of the civil rights movement. And so the easy thing to do would be to say, you know, George Washington is all these good things. And Martin Luther King is a serial adulterer and communist and plagiarist and race hustler who's propped up by the elites to fundamentally restructure American society, which is all true. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm forgetting that this is the first time that many of us are hearing this. And so this is supposed to be the introduction to the MLK pill kind of understanding the truth about this person and what their legacy actually is. And so that's what we're going to actually do today, because to just start opening cans of worms about moral character would start to call into question bad things that Washington did as well. And this is, of course, the BD principle of canonical inclusion, which is essentially that every historical figure who is worth talking about has done something or said something that would get a person in contemporary America fired. So I'm much more concerned about the legacy and impact than I am the character, because obviously historical figures should be measured by their legacies and impacts, right? Like that's kind of the whole point. So it is funny, though, because, you know, when criticizing our heroes, the left always tries to paint them in a bad light to discredit their their legacies and their accomplishments. But when we criticize their heroes, it's because their legacies and their accomplishments suck, like they're worth criticizing. Like, you can't tell me that George Washington didn't actually lead the Continental Army, but Martin Luther King did actually plagiarize his Ph.D. dissertation. and He was actually propped up by the elites in this country, which does call into question this whole oh brilliant mind that was just speaking truth to power, that whole characterization. And it's funny, too, because we've never claimed that our heroes are necessarily necessarily good people. We say that they're great people because they've done great things. But the left's heroes haven't done great things, and so they always prop them up as good people, as these revolutionaries, as these whatever. And in actuality, the case is that they're terrible people, and they have terrible legacies, but you can't say that. You know, George Washington possessed a powerful spirit and a brilliant strategic mind, and it led to the establishment of this great country. Um, but he owns slaves. Yeah. Martin Luther King was a peaceful genius who led a revolution against a system of white supremacy. Virtually everything that you just said is incorrect. And then they just kind of short circuit. So think about that, though. You know, the left celebrates Martin Luther King Jr. as an American hero. They use him in their advertising and promotion for all their racial politics, Black Lives Matter, critical race theory, reparations, police abolition, etc. What does the right do? The right says, no, you fools. This is not what Martin Luther King wanted. He didn't support violence. He didn't support race-based policy. He wanted everyone to be judged by the content of their character. He was a Republican. He liked guns. He was a Christian. You guys are ruining his legacy. No, actually, they are his legacy. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy is Black Lives Matter, critical race theory, reparations, all of it. He would have supported all of it, and I can prove that to you, so be sure to watch all the way through. And I encourage you to please spare me your rebuttals, which were all taught to you in public school by liberal teachers when you were very young. And this was all done intentionally, of course. In other words, if you are pro-MLK and think that he is a good figure in American history and that he wouldn't support everything that's happening now in terms of the racial politics, then you especially need to listen because this is just information that you clearly haven't heard yet. You ever think about that? Do you ever think about why the schools, which you know are run by the left, had you singing songs about this guy when you were very young? It's all conditioning. I never sang one song about a founding father in elementary school, but we had assemblies every year. We had the peace march around the school. Everyone was made to learn that this guy was a hero. And it was all very fun, the whole process. You know, we're singing, we're dancing. We got to leave class. It was a whole thing. Why? Because you have to believe that this guy was a hero in order for this system to make sense. It's a way of controlling the parameters of the discussion. Everyone is conditioned to agree that this guy is a hero. That's not up for debate. The debate is, well, was he a hero in this way, like the left says, or this way, like the right says? Who else is like that in American history where you can only agree that they're a hero? Why is it only him? This is why a lot of you are anxious right now. Like, uh, are you sure we can criticize this guy? Surely he's a hero, isn't he? That's why they get you when you're young. They can literally program you to have an emotional response to criticism of someone that you were taught to idolize as a child. They do the same thing in North Korea, literally the singing, the dancing, all of it, the stories. But there's a reason that this man has equal representation to George Washington on the calendar in this country. Talk about equality of outcome. 
And it's because if George Washington is the figure who represents the founding of this country, its constitution, what it stood for, etc., then Martin Luther King is the figure who represents the legal enshrinement of its antithesis through the changes in federal law that were a result of the civil rights movement. If George Washington represents the freedom of equal opportunity, then Martin Luther King represents the enforcement of equality of outcome. If George Washington represents God-given rights, then Martin Luther King represents civil rights, which in case you didn't know, are defined as the rights of citizens to political and social freedom and equality, which we basically already had. Doesn't that sound familiar though? Aren't we still like hearing this every day in this country? It's almost as if nothing actually has changed. And that's because it, it hasn't. I mean, nothing changes. Nothing ever does. Time is a flat circle. It was never about justice. It was always about paving the way with good intentions, of course, to the destruction of our country. And that's why it has to be a federal holiday. That's why this guy has to be elevated to the level of George Washington, because even though he wasn't even like an exceptional guy, I mean, he wasn't that smart. He was totally propped up. His legacy, his story, the myth of Martin Luther King Jr., the martyr, the man who was just tired of being picked on for no other reason than his skin was dark, he was killed for wanting equality, that's necessary to drill into the consciousness of the American people in order to justify everything that has happened since then, which is why if you're even allowed to criticize racial politics in this country or anything adjacent to it, which in 99% of cases you aren't, you can only make the argument that, well, maybe we should just go back to what our teachers taught us MLK was all about. Duh, maybe we should go back to an earlier stage of liberalism and and scratch your heads why it inevitably leads to this point again. I just, I feel so badly for these people. You know, they've watched their country completely transform and they're looking at the diversity quotas and the reparations and the anti-white racism, the affirmative action, and they're like, well, how did all this happen? It's because of the civil rights movement. That's what started all of this, broadly speaking. And I'm not trying to say the civil rights movement, by the way, didn't have some legitimate grievances. I'm not saying that we should just like undo the whole thing. People are gonna interpret it that way because they wanna paint me in a bad light because they're dishonest. But I'm just here to point out how everything is just basically repeating itself and we were all lied to. So after you're done watching this, I would encourage you to do your own research and then make up your own mind from there. But now, we will go over the popular history of Martin Luther King that we're all taught, why it's not true, what the actual history of Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement is, why he was actually assassinated, and how this predictably has led us to the state of current American politics and governments and culture. So do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Commie. New year, we're back at it. Feels good. The first thing I want to do, though, is explain this shirt here to you guys. Because uh, it does really tie into exactly what we're talking about today. And some of you might remember this, because a few months ago we debuted the concept during a rant about Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement, uh, which of course is the concept of the George Floyd conservative. And it's making fun of this completely tone-deaf tendency that conservatives have to idolize earlier stages of liberalism, perhaps out of this like naive nostalgia for a time when the country was just beginning its decline, because they don't really understand that the earlier stages formed the riverbeds for what we're seeing now. And so I'll play the clip for you now, and then we will continue. Number four, this is too far. We need to go back to insert previous stage of liberalism that was predicted to lead to this. And this is always the case. Third wave feminism is too far, but I like original feminism. Critical race theory is too far, but I like Martin Luther King Jr. He wouldn't have supported this, really? The astroturf communist activist Martin Luther King Jr. who wrote in his journals about things exactly like critical race theory, he wouldn't have supported it, really? Then why do all the veterans of the civil rights movement who marched alongside him, why do they support it? That's a red pill most conservatives are not ready for, the MLK pill. Oh, but John, MLK advocated for peaceful demonstrations. Oh, like peaceful protests? Who told you that, your public school history teacher? Just like Antifa is just an idea, right? Just like 93% of Black Lives Matter protests two summers ago were peaceful, right? Do you understand that almost everything you were ever taught about history is a lie? They're writing the history books because they won. And as they keep winning and writing history books, your kids are going to be taught that Antifa and Black Lives Matter are just ideas that are peaceful. And my sons, all seven of them, are gonna have to red pill your kids. And then you're gonna witness history repeating itself because people online in the 2050s will be writing, the mass execution of conservatives is not what black Lives Matter was about as a George Floyd conservative. <laughs> that's literally, that's going to be, that's like literally what's going to happen. George Floyd conservatism. But here's the point. We don't like feminism because it is the complete inversion of reality. It is built upon the idea that man and woman are equal. Not that they should be treated with equal dignity, but like literally that they are equal. That is untrue. That is unnatural. And it's actually satanic, which could be why less than a hundred years later, child sacrifice is completely normalized in our culture. But when you accept that idea, then anything else is totally fair game because you will have established the slope. And it's a slippery one, as you can clearly see by 
this point, or even MLK, same thing. The principles enshrined by the civil rights movement were expected to have consequences, and exactly what was predicted has come true. What happens when you legally enshrine equality, not just between men and women, but everyone? And then when that equality doesn't happen, because not everyone's equal, you get things like critical race theory. Affirmative action, all of it, it's unavoidable. So it's not enough to say, well, we just need to get back to earlier stages of liberal ideas because those ideas are what led to this in the first place. And the reason people even think that in the first place is because of the liberal conditioning that they've been experiencing for their entire lives. And it's so true. I mean, what we're seeing right now is just history repeating itself and we're living through it. And it really is amazing to try to kind of step back and view it objectively because when you start to do that, you start to ask yourself questions. We like asking questions, right? We want to arrive at the truth, right? So you look at the way that these activists are acting now, how they burn down and destroy your cities and how the media covers for them and says that they're just peaceful protests. And maybe you start to wonder how those same narratives in the media and public education system, which is controlled by communists, those same narratives told you that the civil rights movement, well, those demonstrations demonstrations were peaceful. And MLK was all about peace. And the footage and the stories about the race riots, well, that was because of police brutality and racism. And even MLK, by the way, said riots are the language of the unheard. But those riots were okay, right? It's these ones that are all of a sudden bad, right? And even those were just peaceful demonstrations, kind of like how ours now are peaceful protests, right? And you start to look at how they're saying the same things now about the rioting and the looting, and the media is totally covering for them. Virtually every institution in the country covers for them. And you have to wonder when the switch occurred, right? Because according to the way the right perceives history, or tends to at least, with the civil rights movement, there was a point everyone stopped being racist. They'll say, well, of course racism used to exist in this country, but not anymore. And yet these activists are still rioting, they're still looting, and they're saying the same things now that they were 60 years ago, which we'll get into in more detail as we continue. But my question is, are you actually willing to throw your grandparents and your great-grandparents under the bus and claim that you know better than them and that you are a better person than them? Even ignoring the fact that the ratio of black imprisonment is worse now than back then, homeownership intact family rate, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's literally no metric to suggest that black America is better now than it was 60 years ago, but we're told still that we have to keep making progress. Even ignoring that all of these policies that have been implemented by the federal government have been complete and total failures, the right likes to get their good boy points. They like to say, well, of course there was racism and of course there was police brutality, but not anymore. Now it's just a handful of bad apples. How do you know that though? That's what your schools taught you. And the schools in the future are going to teach your kids the current and updated leftist narratives in addition to the ones that you were taught. Schools in the future are going to teach your children and your grandchildren about Trayvon Martin, about Michael Brown. These are the cases which were both completely justified when you look at the evidence, you actually examine it objectively. These are the cases that caused Black Lives Matter to become a household name. So my point is this. I acknowledge that this country has become less racist in the last 60 years. I acknowledge that police brutality was worse 60 years ago. But I also acknowledge that it's the same class of people who drilled all of that into our heads who are now going to do the same in terms of drilling the narratives surrounding Black Lives Matter into the heads of future generations. And you just have to ask yourselves, are you smarter than your grandparents? If you had a time machine and could go back to the 1960s, do you think that you would beat your grandfather in a debate? You couldn't. Do you know what your grandfather would say if you called him a racist? If you said, Grandpa, you're a racist because you're judging people by the color of their skin and not the content of their character like Martin Luther King Jr. says. He would say, no, it's probably because of the content of their character. And still, you look now, and wherever certain groups of people tend to aggregate, they behave in the same way now that they did back then, and even worse in many cases. So actually, the only thing that's changed is that we're cowards because we're too afraid to acknowledge the issues honestly, and we'd rather go along with what we were taught when we were seven years old, that our grandparents and our great-grandparents, they were stupid. They just thought that because people looked different, they couldn't get along, and I'm seven years old. Even I know better than that. And that's how it's taught to us. That's how it was taught to me. That's how it was taught to you. And it was even taught to me by my music teacher, who upon recollection had short hair, was kind of overweight, didn't have a wedding ring. This woman literally gave us the majority of our civil rights education, which was that racist white people, well, they thought black people were subhuman because of the color of their skin. And Martin Luther King Jr. was a brave hero speaking truth to power. And he was inspired by Rosa Parks, another brave hero who was resisting power. And now we all know better. And they teach you this when you're a child. Your mind is very malleable and impressionable. You don't question a whole lot. What do we always say? The iron law of propaganda is that the earlier you start, the less it has to make sense. Because like we said earlier, their whole agenda only works if you at least believe that the civil rights movement was good. Maybe you push back on critical race theory, on reparations. That doesn't matter to them because they're still educated educating the future generations, and you're still conceding on the most important point, which is that the civil rights movement is good, which implies that this country was deeply racist and oppressive and in need of total reform. And that is what has led to everything else that we're seeing now. And it was predicted to lead to exactly this, but no one listened, or not enough people listened, I should say. 
And again, this is not to say that the civil rights movement did not have some legitimate points. This is not to say that there was no racism or that we should bring back Jim Crow. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that I will not betray my family to play into your arbitrary moral framework. If you are conceding that racism used to exist back then, but not now, that is what leads to where we are now, because it justifies the actions taken by them. If you ask your grandpa in the 1960s if he judges people by the color of their skin, he'd say, no, it's not about skin color. It's because groups behave differently and cultures behave differently, right? Is he right or is he wrong? Because if you make the same claim now, if you say, well, groups behave differently, cultures behave differently, guess what they call you? A racist. Because nothing ever changes and time is a flat circle. It's the same set of problems now that it was back then. The behavior by the activists is the same. The rhetoric from them is the same. You'd be a racist back then, and they're going to write the books that you're a racist now. Their demands are the same. The media, the institutions, they're still running defense for them. That's the same. And they won't acknowledge this because they need you to think that previous generations were just evil. Like, every leftist thinks that their grandparents parents are Calvin Candy. They go to Thanksgiving dinner and politics comes up and their grandpa just says something like, you know, Black Lives Matter should really stop burning down cities and looting. And they just start hallucinating their grandpa just producing a skull like, but this is old George. Now, if you examine this piece of skull, you will find three distinct dimples because this is what they do. This is how they justify everything that they do. People back then were stupid and evil and we're enlightened now. We're progressive now. Like this is their entire concept of what history is. It's not cyclical. It doesn't repeat. We're just always making progress. And the timeline is basically that everything up until the birth of Christ, that was chaos. There was nothing good. It was only pain and suffering, just completely and utterly evil, not even anything approximating a proper level of diversity and inclusion and equity. And then Christ is born. And then from there until about 1939, Handmaid's Tale. Everything is oppressive. Everything is just a power dynamic with white men at the top. Women are sex slaves. White men are responsible for everything bad. And then in 1939, we're introduced to a man with a funny mustache who was ostensibly the final boss. And that went on for about six years. And then we were making so much progress towards diversity and equity and inclusion. But then in 2015, you know how like in old slasher movies, the killer always jumps back up like one last time, like, you know, on Friday the 13th with the, with the canoe. That's basically what happened with Donald Trump. You know, he rallies the racists and the fascists and the homophobes and the sexists and the transphobes. And we were, they were all, they were all up against the resistance, up against Dumbledore's army. And then evil was finally defeated. And now we're living through the only remotely righteous time in the history of human existence. It's only right now where we have our democracy and a accountability and equity. This is literally what these people think. The point of all this being that we have to decide what we want to believe and we have to decide who we want to believe. It should set off alarm bells in your head that you're not allowed to dispute that this man was a hero. It should set off alarm bells in your head that when you see the left, the communists, Black Lives Matter, all of these people who you know are your enemies, you see them celebrating this person and you're like, no, they're not celebrating him in the right way. Fools, a lot of them. Maybe you're the fool. Maybe you need to understand that it's a tug of war. It is a zero sum game. And if they they can keep you stationed at, well, yes, of course, MLK was a hero and the civil rights movement was justified. Eventually, your grip will slip over the course of new generations and new psyops because you refuse to push back. You want to slowly keep giving these people ground and they'll just keep marching down the field. Like, that's why we lose. We buy into their framework because we're afraid. That's what the George Floyd conservative is about. It's making fun of the fact that these types of people 30 years from now are going to be doing the same thing with Black Lives Matter and with people like George Floyd. Well, Black Lives Matter was about peace. George Floyd, he, he was the real real conservative. He was in support of Austrian economics like me. He was a martyr for the cause of ending the Federal Reserve because he used a counterfeit 20 to, to make the point that there's really no difference in value between that and a minted 20 since it's all operating as fiat currency and the state killed him for it. I'm a George Floyd conservative and it's like, no, no, you have to push back against these people. You have to swim upstream. You have to say, no, Martin Luther King is not a hero. His legacy is not good. And we're going to explain why in a second. So definitely stick around. But that is the root of this. Everything we're seeing now, whether it's affirmative action, diversity quotas, reparations, Black Lives Matter, anti-white racism, all throughout the culture, the rewriting of history to demonize and erase white Americans, but to elevate and exaggerate the contributions of everyone else, all of it. That is why it has to be a holiday, literally meaning holy day of celebration. If George Washington gets a day because the story goes that he founded the country that defeated the oppressive British government to cement that all men are deserving of equal rights, then Martin Luther King gets a day because the story will be that he transformed the country and defeated the oppressive white people to cement that all non-white people are deserving of equal outcomes. And even more than that, of equity to make up for past injustices, which he was totally in support of. That's the truth. But very few people will tell you that. But before we continue, I must say, it's a new year. We're still riding the decline. Why not do so in comfort and style and in celebration of American masculinity? How do you do that? Get new underwear. Wearing underwear with another man's name on the waistband? Questionable. 
Also, if it's made with polyester, it's literally hurting your balls, which affects your fertility and your testosterone. That's not a joke. I'm like, I'm trying to help you. So how do I help you? By telling you to get a drawer full of undertack. The only boxers endorsed by me. I don't know if that counts for anything, but still, like these really are the best underwear that I've ever owned, which is why they're sponsoring the channel. So what are they on about? Uh, they have a quick release fly for a quick draw, secret pocket in the extra wide waistband for tactical necessities or cash. I mean, you never know when you're going to need cash or a handcuff key, right? Also, the material is antibacterial, moisture wicking so you stay fresh, but also not polyester. Again, so important. Check your underwear. It's making you depressed and impotent. And of course, it's durable, fade resistant, shrink resistant, ultra lightweight, almost 30% less than the competition too. It's also the only brand that is unapologetically pro-America and pro-Second Amendment. So go to getundertack.com. That is getundertack.com right now. They're running a New Year's special. Get 20% off with the offer code DOYLE20. 20% off with the offer code DOYLE20. Satisfaction guaranteed or get your money back. That is getundertack.com. Offer code DOYLE20. Very epic. We continue. I do have to say one more thing before we break down the real history of this whole thing, which is that the conservative tendency to fixate on MLK and generally speaking hypocrisy like this whole MLK wouldn't have supported this. MLK said this and yet you guys are doing this. It's all so symptomatic of the fact that conservatives have absolutely unequivocally no understanding of political power. None. It's childlike. And you can tell by how smug they get with this. They think they're being very clever by pointing out a quote from Martin Luther King where he says that we need to judge people based on character instead of skin. And yet the libs are all focused on identity politics. Like, are you kidding? me, Martin Luther King. He was the king of identity politics. He wrote the manual on it. We're getting ahead of ourselves again. I will elaborate momentarily. It is legitimately impossible for me to get through one monologue without berating right-wing weakness, right? But the point is that conservatives have an allegiance to principles, and the left has an allegiance to goals, right? Conservatives have an allegiance to the rules of the game. The left has an allegiance to actually winning the game. Conservatives have an allegiance to the rules of the game, and the left has an allegiance to their team, to their friends. And so when conservatives complain that the left they're not following their own standards. They're being hypocrites. That doesn't even matter to them. That only matters to you. And it's why you lose because you don't understand politics. You have no concept of it. The left has an allegiance to ends. The right has an allegiance to means. And when you see past the failures of these graceful principles of yours, you realize that the only relevant political virtue is loyalty. That's it. Politics is fundamentally about doing favors for your friends and punishing your enemies. And certainly, certainly, ethical politics do not scale to hostile outgroups. Certainly, it would be suicidal to extend ethical politics, to extend good faith beyond issues of things like tax policy. I mean, why would you ever treat someone who wants to completely destroy your way of life and who openly admits this and celebrates this and campaigns on this? Why would you ever treat them as anything except for your enemy? Well, because we're better than them. Really? Really? Because no one's going to know about that once they erase our country from history because you think that losing is a virtue coward. Hypocrisy is only a sin to people who actually believe in truth and morality, which these people openly reject. So if you believe that you can still hold them to that standard, then you're foolish. And the only position that you should ever hold in politics is bringing Emperor Trump a Diet Coke, because that's all about you have the cognitive infrastructure to do, frankly. You know, I went to a Stars game recently. I had this realization. Even drunk hockey fans understand politics better than the average conservative. A Stars player can do anything, and they will not concede wrongdoing. It could be the most insignificant thing, minor penalty, high sticking, and the fans just immediately, ref, you suck, ref, you suck. And I'm watching this, and I'm like, if we lose, nothing bad's going to happen. Like, it's inconsequential. Nothing. Nothing happens. Yet the fans understand this distinction between the friend and the enemy, and it's because they want to win the game. But the average conservative, who has done nothing but lose, and if he continues to lose, it means the destruction of his country and of the futures of his children? This is a guy who's willing more than anyone to throw his own people under the bus in the name of principles, to get some good boy points from the left, right? Because the only thing that the average conservative hates more than a radical leftist is someone who cares more about actually conserving the country more than they do. But anyways, I think it's all safe to say that we have an understanding of who Martin Luther King was, what the civil rights movement was purportedly about, because it's virtually impossible to grow up in this country without learning about those things. So before we kind of go through the timeline, I want to address what are, in my opinion, the two biggest misconceptions that we have about Martin Luther King and about the nonviolent civil rights movement. And those are that it was nonviolent and that it was a movement. And then this will kind of help us get into our timeline of the correct history behind it. So we hear all the time about how Martin Luther King was calling for peaceful demonstrations and it was a nonviolent movement at its core. And the two most important things to understand about this are that one, Martin Luther King was not the only black leader in America at the time. And two, actions speak louder than words. We have to look at this within its complete historical context. And existing concurrently to Martin Luther King was a movement of black nationalists that was becoming increasingly popular. And these people would straight up give press conferences where they would explicitly call for violence against whitey. And this was like scaring white people. And so... 
Martin Luther King had to come out and just keep reminding people that what his movement was about was nonviolence and that they were against violence. And so this is because King understood correctly that he was going to need the support of white people in order to achieve the power necessary to implement his goals. Whereas the black nationalists, you know, they had basically given up on white people. Uh, They weren't allowing white people into their groups. They were calling, of course, for violence against white people, etc. And King's understanding of the necessity of white support gets into the other components of the nonviolence perception, which is that people operate within his coalition, they would deliberately go into places where they knew they would be met with hostility. And they would instruct the young people to literally cause trouble at these demonstrations so that they would devolve into chaos because they understood that once the cameras were rolling and they captured these shots of the fire hoses and the nightsticks, then that footage would make people feel sympathetic to their cause and feel more inclined to support them, which is exactly what happened. The news media would broadcast out of context footage to support the narrative of these people and the masses would go along with it because it was effective. So. Does this ring a bell? I mean, the point being, you can talk about nonviolence all you want, peaceful protests all you want, but actions speak louder than words. And this gets into the other misconception of it, which is that it was a movement. And we've talked about this before, but typically the cycle of these leftist movements is that they succeed, and then upon taking power, they write the history books such that they depict this very appealing narrative of everyone just woke up one day and realized that people were being picked on, and they spoke truth to power, and they led a movement, and the good guys won. And this is what you see with feminism, it's what you see with the civil rights movement with the LGBT movement. It's all the same. But of course, that's never what happens. It's always a group of activists who have the backing of the institutions. Martin Luther King had the backing of the media. He had the backing of the universities. He had the backing of the elites for reasons we'll get into. He had the backing of the cultural elites and celebrities for reasons we'll get into. And he had the complete backing of the federal government, which made this entire thing possible. And without that, there's absolutely no way he would have succeeded. It would have been impossible. And it's the same thing nowadays. Nothing ever changes. I'm going to show you this clip right now uh, to give you kind of an idea of how true that is. Here's a clip from 1972 where a woman named Angela Davis addresses an audience to talk about a case where a 24-year-old black woman named Emily Butler, who worked for the IRS one day, decided to go out to her car and get a gun and then come back and murder her white supervisor in cold blood. And I'll explain why this is significant afterwards. But take a look at this and listen very closely to what she's saying. You heard about the case of Emily Butler? It's a very tragic case. Because when we talk about racism and the black worker, we have to look, try to understand what's been happening with the Emily Butlers. She's the sister who worked at the Atlanta Internal Revenue Service Bureau. And as she had mentioned on many occasions prior to the charges being lodged against her, she felt that she was a particular target of the racism, the institutionalized racism in the sense that she never got promoted whenever times for promotion came around. Whenever she made a request, her request was always denied. And when it came to just outright, blatant, overt racist harassment, she had to deal with that every single day, every day she went to work. And you see, one day, she asked to see her doctor, and they told her no. And then they started screaming at her that she had punched in her time she, her time card two minutes late. And then, they, then the, the white four men and four women really began to get on her back, and the sister became so desperate that she didn't know what to do. And she went and got a gun and she shot two women. But you see, let's try to understand what was happening in that situation. Because that's certainly not the answer to liberation. I mean, we got hundreds of thousands of Emily Butlers. And we have to realize that Emily Butler is not guilty. It is racism that pulled that trigger. Racism. And if anybody needs to be indicted and imprisoned, it's the reincarnation of racism himself, Richard Nixon. Did you notice how the audience started clapping after she said that she shot the woman in cold blood? Like they had to be shushed because they started clapping. And she also says, it is racism that pulled that trigger. What a sentence. 
There is literally like there is no better sentence to describe the politics of black America than it is racism that pulled that trigger. You can't write this stuff like you watch that clip from 50 years ago and it sounds like it was recorded yesterday. How many stories do we see now? Well, you don't see them, but they still happen of black people assaulting white people or even killing white people and then claiming afterwards that it was because of racism as if that's like a justification. And what's the response to it? Well, they got what they deserved. That's what you get which is a lot like how this audience claps here when they hear that this black woman murdered this white woman in cold blood. So maybe nothing ever changes. Maybe black people have basically just been using racism as an excuse for their behavior, uh, which is why they pledge allegiance to the left. The essence of left-wing political thought is the abdication of responsibility. It's never your fault. It's always something else. You're always a victim. You're always oppressed. It's always a poor environment, etc. And so even when all the policies that the left has passed in the last 60 years have put black Americans in an even worse position than they were 60 years ago, they still don't care. And they will still block vote for Democrats because their culture would rather blame racism than address its own problems. And I dare you to tell me that I'm wrong. And what's the answer to this from the right? Well, you know, the left is actually being racist when they tell you that you need uh, help to succeed because uh, it's, it's the soft bigotry of low expectations. Okay, but then what happens? They're still not succeeding. And the left gives them a good answer, which is, uh, it's because of white people and racism. Vote secured. And I did a whole hour-long this video, dissertation, whatever, debunking the idea of systemic racism, everything from slavery leading to poverty, uh, to poor education leading to poverty, to police and judicial bias, everything. There's a ton of research. It's airtight. But no one wants to have an honest conversation about this. And it's a tired point, but it's true. Because there's a bunch of black people in this audience who agree. But guess what happens when they try to bring this stuff up? Oh, you're an Uncle Tom. Oh, you're acting white. They literally get casted out. Like, I know that there are some leftists in Beverly Hills, California, who take issue with this. But when you go to public school 15 minutes outside of Detroit, you learn a couple things. And one of the things you learn is that black kids who want to pay attention in class, take advanced classes, do their homework, study for tests, they get told that they're acting white and other black kids won't hang out with them. There were black girls at my high school who weren't allowed to say the N-word because they acted white, which it's honestly kind of funny, but it's true. And it's a problem and no one wants to talk about it. You know, I used to work at a subway back in high school and I worked with a woman who would take the bus up Woodward to get to the store. And for those unfamiliar, there's a road in Michigan called Woodward that runs from Detroit Northwest up until Pontiac. And so she would take the bus from the city to work at our store. And then one day she bought a car. And then a couple months later, her car got stolen when it was like parked at her apartment or something. And so she comes into work and she tells my boss about it. She tells me about it. And my boss says something like, damn, you know, that really sucks. Just unlucky, I guess. And she said, no, no, they did that intentionally because they were mad that I got a car. They were like, like targeting her intentionally because they didn't want her to succeed. And at the time I thought she was just being paranoid, but I don't know, maybe she was right because every time I talk to black people about this stuff, I hear stories like this. But then when I talk to white liberals who think that they understand black culture because they went to a private school that had two black kids who for all intents and purposes acted like white kids and who like, I don't know, read the new Jim Crow in their social studies class, they tell me all the approved talking points. It is not their fault. It's because of different forms of institutional racism. It's the same way that during the civil rights movement, they were able to win the support of white people in the north and in the suburbs by showing them the footage of police spraying hoses at these activists. And they thought, oh, these poor people, they're just being targeted for no reason. And it was the people in the south who actually lived alongside them who were saying, well, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And we see the same thing now. It's always the white liberals who live in the least black areas who live in the gated communities, who live on the coasts, who go to these private schools. These are the people who tell us that they understand black culture. And everything I just said is actually racist. Really? Because I have black friends and I have for my whole life. <laughs> racists always say they have black friends. Maybe because they're not actually racist, you stupid bitch. How could a racist have friends that they hate? What kind of low standard are you setting for these people who are apparently oppressing everybody who doesn't look like them? Isn't the quintessential example of American racism for you people segregation? Where white people were separate from black people and now when white people are friends, with black people, you're like, well, that's the same, that's what racist people do too. And you can believe these things simultaneously because you are incapable of penetrating thought and the collective contents of your brain have been decided for you by think tanks. But I spent hours almost every weekend of my childhood in the neighborhoods of Detroit doing work in the churches for as long as I can remember. Not downtown, not the university district, the parts that look like a war zone where you see rotting boats upturned in the street for no reason. Houses burned out, still. Neighborhoods hollowed out, still. But I'm the racist because I don't buy into the narratives that, that the people who live in all white neighborhoods promote and who operate within the coalition that has destroyed basically every major city in the country under the guise of justice. And 
who when they make enough money selling this bullshit, they move to even whiter areas. You people are scum. I'll make a deal with you. I'll fly you out to Detroit and we will drop you off on Fenkel Avenue with 10 copies of the new Jim Crow and wearing a pair of Cartier sunglasses. And if I come back in an hour and you've given out all 10 copies without losing the glasses, you can keep them. How about this? There's a McDonald's at Joy Road in Southfield. They call it the Murder Mac. You can guess why. If you can walk in there with five bags of groceries, because remember, the only reason black people eat fast food is because they can't afford or access groceries, right? Like that's what you people believe. So if you can walk in there and hand out five bags of groceries without losing the car to yours, you can keep them. Actually, if the people even accept the groceries, you can keep them. Do it. I dare you. Send me an email. Libtards wanted for social experiments. Maybe I'm the racist in the sense that I understand groups and culture and the way that a dentist understands teeth. That's the thing. Everyone is racist. Everyone naturally has in-group preference, right? Well, white people people actually have the least amount of it and black people have the greatest amount of it, by the way, but everyone has it. And in terms of racism, right-wing people tend to be racist in the sense that they acknowledge that there are differences between groups, but left-wing people are racist in the sense that they literally look down on these people. And virtually nothing I've said here is incorrect, by the way. And the best part of it is that everyone who is going to contest this is going to be white. Actually, that's not the best part. The best part is that if these idiots try to take me up on it and they become one of the dozens of people every year who get killed over Cartier sunglasses in Detroit, it's a whole thing, they call them buffs, they would have the same thing to say about it that the woman said in the video. It's racism that pulled the trigger. You were trying to give them a book about that very racism, or you were trying to give them healthy food, which apparently they don't have access to because of racism, and you got shot for it. But it's not their fault, it's because of racism. Because racism tells them to fixate on designer sunglasses and kill people over them, right? See how it comes full circle? The rant served a purpose. We're the ones who actually want black America to be successful, but we have to stop pretending that just throwing money at them is the key to that because that has achieved virtually nothing. And in fact, it's made the situation significantly worse. We are officially off track, but in a very real sense, we're all better because of it. I don't know, I just get so tired of these people. Like they could not possibly be speaking with more passion and less truth, so incessantly. You wanna fix the neighborhoods? Yeah, me too. The answer isn't less police, it's actually more police because there's not gonna be economic opportunity in areas with high crime because businesses lose too much money with robbery and with theft and with low traffic. Oh, the income in the cities is low. Yeah, because you people offshore the American manufacturing economy because you thought that it would spread liberalism and democracy, so let's bring that back. Fathers aren't present. Okay, get rid of no-fault divorce laws. That's at least a start, right? But no one wants to actually have serious solutions to these problems because they'd rather just increase their money and power off them because they're vampires. So I want to go back to that clip, though, because it's important to what we're talking about because what she's alluding to in that clip uh, when talking about the black woman who murders her white supervisor in cold blood because of racism, whatever that means, this alludes to this idea that we all seem to have present in our consciousness, which is I guess present 50 years ago too, because nothing ever changes, but this is the idea of racism somehow justifying violence. So I'll just say this now, uh, racism doesn't justify violence, let alone murder. Vague racism doesn't justify violence, let alone murder. But we all think it does because we're too scared to be honest with ourselves. And because of this, people can commit crimes and use racism as an excuse, whether it were real or whether they just made it up. And they know that they can get the public on their side that way, as if even if it were real, that would somehow justify the action. And of course, racism is vaguely defined. She even uses the term that we hear all the time, institutionalized racism. And this raises a few questions, because remember, this took place in the early 1970s. That means the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act passed. Supreme Court has banned the outlawing of interracial marriage. They've, you've now actually got a black man on the Supreme Court now, Thurgood Marshall means you still have all the institutions on your side, the media on your side, which is how the civil rights movement was successful in the first place. Like people seem to forget that this institutionalized racism, which appeals to this vague idea about the power in this country, that power was all on their side. The federal government was sending armed troops to enforce the policies of the civil rights movement all throughout the country. That's the institutionalized racism, the institution that had federal troops poking white high school students with bayonets to enforce the policies of the civil rights movement, which is all just to say that like, you know, they clearly can't define institutionalized racism now, well, they couldn't define it then either. And just like they pretend that they're speaking truth to power now, despite having all the power on their side, they had it back then too. They had the federal government throughout all the 1960s and that was all it took. And we're gonna get into more detail with that in a second, but I'm just trying to kind of illustrate to you the parallels so we can understand that this is just history repeating itself. And if we wanna solve these problems, then we have to stop making the same mistakes, which means we have to stop taking these people at their word. Again, stop listening to communists. That woman was a communist, by the way, Angela Davis. 
Here's how this connects to Martin Luther King. Angela Davis had teamed up with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference during the Emily Butler trials to try to rally public support for this woman. And of course, Martin Luther King was the first president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He was there when it was established. It was effectively his organization, so to speak. Like, you know, when you heard SCLC, you thought MLK and vice versa. And so when Angela Davis announced that she was teaming up with Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference to get justice for Emily Butler, she delivered this announcement at Martin Luther King's old church in Atlanta, Georgia. And during during this announcement, she said that the fight to free Emily Butler is a fight to form a society in which we ourselves are at the helm. What does the word helm mean? Where are my pirates? To be at the helm of something means to be in control of it. That's what the goal has always been. Angela Davis was a member of the Communist Party. The goal was never equality or representation or whatever. It was, is, and always will be control. Because the only way to construct a society that lets people literally get away with murder because of racism, be given endless amounts of cash and opportunities and whatever else, all because of racism, the only way to have that would be to control it. Because otherwise, the people in that society would just say, well, I'm sorry, but we're a meritocracy. We like our freedom. You know, these, these things aren't just going to fly here. The point being that there's a reason that these people were communists, and there's a reason that all of their arguments are divorced from reality, and it's that their goals aren't actually what they say they are. And if there's one thing that you take away from all of this, it's that you never listen to a communist or anyone who is sympathetic or adjacent to communists, like, ever. This should be self-evident. And the point of all of this is to kind of begin to honestly examine the true legacy of Martin Luther King. Like, what does it tell you when the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, his thing, they're allying with an open member of the Communist Party and announcing that partnership in his old church to protest against the imprisonment of a black woman who murdered her white supervisor in cold blood because it isn't her fault and it was because of racism. What does that tell you? What does it tell you when Ralph Abernathy, the guy who co-founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the guy who was Martin Luther King's mentor, the guy who took over from Martin Luther King after he was assassinated, what does it tell you when that guy is friends with Angela Davis, when he goes to East Germany to deliver speeches on her behalf, and then he comes back and he tells her that he actually likes their model? When Angela Davis, who's at the heart of this movement, who's at the heart of this coalition, when she says that Ralph Abernathy and Martin Luther King taught her that socialism is the answer? What about when Martin Luther King, in one of his last speeches delivered at the Riverside Church, he says that these are revolutionary times all over the globe. Men are revolting against old systems of exploitation and oppression, and out of the wombs of a frail world, new systems systems of justice and equality are being born. The shirtless and barefoot people of the land are rising up as never before. The people who sat in darkness have seen a green light. We in the West must support these revolutions. What do you think he's talking about there? Birds of the same feather, right? Maybe it was calculated that the enshrinement of equality, a term that's almost self-justifying, right? It sounds so splendid, a term that is the backbone of communism, the antithesis of this country and of the free world and of Christianity. Maybe it was calculated that equality could be sold to the American people under the guise of healing racism. And the result would be the total enshrinement of equality as the governing philosophy and religion of the country. And when nothing changed, and when the problems were still the same, and when the rhetoric was still the same, it wouldn't even matter because the pieces had already been put into place. Maybe that's why all these civil rights movement leaders had communist ties. Maybe that's why Martin Luther King, who wasn't exceptionally intelligent, maybe that's why he had Stanley Levinson, one of the major contributors to the American Communist Party, maybe that's why he had him ghostwrite his I Have a Dream speech. Maybe that's why Martin Luther King said to the board of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1967 that the evils of capitalism are as real as the evils of militarism and racism, and that the problems of racial injustice and economic injustice cannot be solved without a radical redistribution of political and economic power. And then we look 50 years later and Black Lives Matter is run by open Marxists and we're like, how could this happen? Because it's all the same goal. And it always has been. And maybe from where you're standing, it just seems like a 60 year streak of bad luck. But the truth is the game was rigged from the start. And so the point of all of this is just to kind of illustrate the foundations for what Martin Luther King's legacy would actually become to show how it was totally destined to follow the path that it has. There was no point where they just took it too far or, well, they aren't following his teachings correctly. No, this was always the point, which we'll continue to elaborate on as we continue. But the last thing that's important to recognize in terms of the parallels is how these movements have to invent their own martyrs. They're rallying to the defense of a black woman who killed her white supervisor in cold blood saying she didn't do anything wrong and that the real problem is actually racism. Fast forward 50 years, what do we have now? We have Black Lives Matter rallying around Michael Brown, who they say didn't do anything wrong. They, uh, the real problem was racism, right? Or Trayvon Martin, who again, didn't do anything wrong. The real problem, racism. Do you see the pattern? Nothing ever changes. These activists lie. And if you believe them, then you deserve everything that's coming to you. But your children don't and your grandchildren don't and I don't. So maybe it's time to stop believing them. 
Now, the last adjacent parallel that I'd like to illustrate before we go through the reality of the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King point by point is pertaining to the race riots in the summer of 1967. This was called the long hot summer because it was a summer of race riots. There were 159 of them that broke out in every major city in the country and dozens more. And adjusting for inflation, these did about a billion dollars worth of damage to the country. And there was a presidential commission established called the Kerner Commission after its chair, Otto Kerner, who was the governor of Illinois. And this commission basically sought to diagnose the cause of the riots and figure out how to prevent them from happening in the future. So the first thing to note in this timeline, remember 1967, Martin Luther King is still alive. Lyndon Johnson's the president. He's more than happy to mobilize the power of the federal government to enforce the victories of the civil rights movement. And we've got the Civil Rights Act. We've got the Voting Rights Act. It's looking really good for these activists, right? But still, these riots break out across the country. They irreparably destroy a bunch of formerly great cities. And then this commission is formed. And after seven months, they release their report as to what caused the riots and what can be done to prevent them in the future. And you will never guess what they concluded was the cause. Lack of economic opportunity, failed social service programs, police brutality, racism, and whites-oriented media. This was 55 years ago, and it sounds like it was from two summers ago. Except now they don't say whites-oriented media, they just say representation. But it all means the same thing. And just like the riots we saw two summers ago were blamed on the same things these were, these rioters didn't face any consequences either beyond being subdued by the National Guard. No, the report places all of the blame on white people. It literally says, and I'm quoting, that white racism is what was responsible for the explosive mixture which was accumulating in our cities. And this really is what cemented what we now just take for granted and don't question, which is that you cannot criticize black people. And if you do, then you deserve whatever happens to you as a result, because virtually anything that black people do that would be condemned as poor behavior by white people is either in response to or because of white people and racism, which are effectively indissoluble according to this narrative. And of course, this leads to questions. You have to ask why cities in the North were burned to the ground when cities in the South like Birmingham weren't, despite the fact that conditions for black people in these cities were infinitely worse, like it's not even close. Or if the problems were white racism, then why didn't this occur before the civil rights movement had secured so many victories, like say 40 years prior? And why do they still occur 50, 60 years after we've spent all of this time and all of this money following the guidelines as outlined by this commission and by these activists? Why is it? Because this had to be the justification for the restructuring of American society. The destruction of white racism is ultimately code for the destruction of American society because the prescriptions for the abolition of racism end up meaning the abolition of true meritocracy, of freedom of speech, of national sovereignty and borders, of a true market-based economy, of the American dream, of property rights, of the family unit, in essence, the entire country, which they don't even try to hide because they openly say that they hate this country, that they hate its systems, that they hate its founders, and they want to completely restructure the entire thing from the ground up, starting with the Constitution in the name of this vaguely defined concept of justice or equity or our democracy or who we are or whatever the focus group currently has churned out this cycle. It's not rocket science. They're spelling it out for you. Everything is the fault of white racism. And since white people are inherently racist and therefore their institutions and systems are inherently racist, they have to be changed. And so every policy will ultimately seek to redistribute wealth, opportunities, resources, enforcement of laws, etc., in a way that negatively affects the society as a whole, but serves the interests of the power in society operating under the guise of justice with the support of those who believe they've been persecuted and those who sympathize with them because of propaganda. That cannot be overstated. Why do you think that you were taught to idolize MLK? It's the same type of nostalgia that we get for people like JFK, and it's poisonous. Oh, well, JFK would have been a Republican nowadays. Here's this figure that the left has popularized. Well, I'm going to try to play into their framework and see if it'll benefit me. If you've ever said anything to the effect of, oh, if only Democrats were like Kennedy and Republicans were like Reagan, you have been psyoped, my friend. That's not inherently bad. However, in a serious political discussion, let's not pretend that two incredibly charismatic and handsome presidents who were in office during a time that two generations get respectively nostalgic for are really the gold standard for statesmen in this country. Really? JFK would have been a Republican because he, like, supported the Second Amendment and wanted to cut taxes? JFK wrote a nation of immigrants. He believed America was just an idea that anyone in the world could and should be able to just come and live here. Like, he was totally in support of the civil rights movement, and his legacy is Lyndon Johnson, his vice president, whose legacy is open borders and the civil rights movement. Like, he literally set into motion the final nail in this country's coffin. And you want to talk about history repeating itself? Look up the election of 1960. Look up the weird stuff that went on with those votes. Oh, but JFK... JFK would be a conservative now. Now? Yeah, maybe after seeing the consequences of his ideas, maybe after learning that to conserve a nation, you have to conserve the borders that he destroyed. Give me a break. JFK couldn't even conserve the composition of his skull. <gasps> Boo-hoo. You're, you're going to be unfaithful to a woman as gorgeous as Jackie Kennedy? Yeah, I'm going to make fun of you. 
not sorry. Oh, but John, they took him out because of this quote I found where he said he didn't like the CIA or the Federal Reserve or something. You know, every time I hear that, I actually get jealous of him. It's more complicated than that. But anyways, yeah, JFK conservatives. We're all going to be JFK conservatives if we don't get this country turned around. But anyways, the significance of the propaganda conditioning cannot be overstated because as much as we would like to think otherwise, politics is always personal. And if you've been conditioned to like someone, then you're going to be more supportive of or at least sympathetic to the things that they're promoting. And this is why we're taught to idolize MLK, to idolize Rosa Parks, etc. Like if you look at who high school students are saying are the top 10 heroes in American history, guess who they say? They say Martin Luther King. They say Rosa Parks. They say Harriet Tubman. All figures who serve roles in propping up these narratives that have been so destructive to this country. And that's why high schoolers are taught to be idolizing these figures. Like, what do you think the butterfly effect of that is going to be down the line? So this is why people are going to get emotional because I'm going after MLK. Um, are you actually like anti MLK, my dude? Yikes. Like this can only surprise you when the contents of your brain have been decided by a think tank. You are incapable of original thought because you're weak. And if the narrative told you to paint your face like a clown, you would do it because already it's gotten you guys to stick things in yourselves and chop things off. So you're barely alive. Like there's no effective difference between you and an AI that has read Twitter and read it for like two hours. Oh, MLK is so good. Oh, Rosa Parks, a communist activist who staged that incident, which led to the boycott. Oh, she's so good. Harriet Tubman. She saved so many people. Did she? I want you to guess right now, in case you don't know. You're familiar with the story of Harriet Tubman. Of course you are. Guess how many people she saved. Not saying she's not a hero, just trying to evaluate how much of a hero you have to be in order to be within the regime's top 10 heroes in American history. She saved 70 people. Oh, Harriet Tubman, she saved 70 people that are throw her on the $20 bill because we need every figure in American history to serve our narrative that says the white people are the worst. Yeah, well, white people invented the abolition of slavery, yet we're demonized in countries that we built by people who apparently couldn't do the same in their own countries before coming to ours. When do we get white people day? We don't even need a month. We just need a day. Like, we tend to be more punctual. Shouldn't be a problem. Like, we're pretty neat, right? Hey, you're going to be in the office tomorrow? Ah, uh, no, it's white people day. Oh, that's right. You know, you got any plans? Yeah, you know, me and the boys, we're going to be headed up north, uh, taking the bay line around, maybe do some fishing, maybe get the skis out. Oh, well, hey, be sure to gas up with jerry cans beforehand so you don't have to stop at the marina on the lake because that, that's how they get you. See, I'm tired of this. I'm so tired of being hated for things I didn't do by people who never experienced them in the first place. And it's funny because they have to invent these myths and narratives about how white people are just evil and just constantly, relentlessly, incessantly shove them down everybody's throats because otherwise people would just look at white people and be like, yeah, I mean, they're kind of goofy, but you know, they mostly just keep to themselves. And it's the exact opposite with everyone else, with every other group who's oppressed. You know, they use the language of oppression to allude to these images of slavery, right? Slavery in this country. And yet they include people who were never enslaved under the same umbrella. It's like a Trojan horse that is painted in the blood of black slaves. But if it weren't for this vague historical narrative of oppression surrounding all of these groups of people, oh, they've been through so much. Oh, we just have to feel so bad for them. Then people would probably just look at them and be like, why are they acting like that? That's not normal behavior. Like, please just stop. But they don't. This is what propaganda does. This is what conditioning does. And speaking of conditioning, let us now clear up the historiography of the civil rights movements and of MLK. So like we said earlier, the criticisms of Martin Luther King actually disprove the image that he's always portrayed as. Whereas, again, it's not like Washington didn't actually lead the Continental Army. So the first thing to understand is that effectively the leader of black America before Martin Luther King was Jackie Robinson, who, of course, was a very popular baseball player, played for the Dodgers when they were still in Brooklyn. And he would later become heavily involved with the civil rights movement. And he would team up with Martin Luther King and his Southern Christian Leadership Conference. But the thing about Jackie Robinson is that he was first and foremost a baseball player, right? Like that's what he liked to do. That's what he was good at. And so there needed to be somebody who could fit the role, right? And that's really important to understand because people like to forget that Martin Luther King did not become a leader or he did not ascend to leadership, so to speak, but rather he was cast as that. Because remember, they're trying to elevate and enshrine equality as effectively the new religion and governing philosophy of the United States, but you're still dealing with a country that's like 90% white and Christian. So it's like, how do you do that? You have to speak to them in a language that they understand, which is where Martin Luther King comes into play because they needed someone who was relatively biblically literate so they could use Christian language to appeal to white America and sell them on these ideas. And also because the church has always been influential in black 
black America and America in general too. But there were a few other black leaders within the Southern churches at the time who had some issues with each other. And so it was thought that Martin Luther King was good because he more or less got along with everybody, which not only would make things run more smoothly, but it would also reduce the chances of someone trying to attack him or bring him down in the future, which of course would hurt the movement as a whole. And so the other thing that cannot be overstated is that the civil rights movement had the complete backing of the institutions. They had the backing of the elites, the elite universities, the media, tons of figures from the popular culture, and most importantly, the federal government. Like both Nixon and Kennedy were running in 1960 on a platform of being pro-civil rights movement. And both of them maintained a good relationship with Martin Luther King. And here's another thing that should ring a bell for you. JFK used to do fundraisers to raise money for the bail of people who would get arrested for rioting and looting at these peaceful demonstrations. And by that point, the Department of Justice would basically do whatever Martin Luther King wanted. And the counterpoints to this are always as follows. One, this vague idea, this eternal and vague idea of American racism, systemic racism, etc. Two, that J. Edgar Hoover was using his FBI to spy on MLK and his associates. And three, that he was assassinated. And because of these points, we're supposed to just believe that MLK was this dissenting voice. He was a threat to the establishment. So we've already covered why the systemic racism thing is stupid. But with Hoover's FBI, I actually agree that this was a violation of privacy. But nothing came of it. Nothing was going to come of it, at least in the short run. And the idea behind it was that they had to spy on Martin Luther King because of his rumored ties and sympathies to communism, which turned out to be true. But I doubt that this stuff would have been leaked to the public at a point where it would have mattered. And it ended up actually being Martin Luther King's associates who would spill the beans on his degeneracy after he died, that he was cheating on his wife with all sorts of different women, many of them prostitutes etc. He watched and laughed while one of his associates raped a woman. There's that too. Hey, hey, I'm just telling you the truth here. But the point is that J. Edgar Hoover being paranoid and just spamming the wiretaps, that's not really enough to outweigh the overwhelming and universal support that MLK had from the power in this country, I don't think. And then for the assassination, we'll address that at the end. But yeah, Martin Luther King knew that he depended on the federal government to accomplish anything since they were the entity that had the authority and the power to actually enforce these things nationwide. And by that point, the federal government was like completely willing to serve as the enforcement for the civil rights movement. And they utilized the media in a way that rings bells for us too because they would intentionally get arrested at these demonstrations to draw national attention. Because even though there was crime in the Southern cities, they were able to win over support in the North and in the suburbs where there were the least amount of black people because you know they would just see this footage on television, the same footage that we were all shown in classrooms when we were kids and you know just kind of assume that peaceful protesters were being picked on for no reason at all. And that's so important to understand too. These protests and peaceful marches were devolving into riots, just like how we see now. You know, I've gone to these demonstrations before and Everyone shows up and they'll do a peaceful march. Everything goes fine. It's after the march when the crowd is still there. That's when things get tricky. And so the emphasis that we're all reminded King put on peace and nonviolence, it was all good branding, it was all good optics, but it rarely reflected the reality of the situation. And as we mentioned earlier, there was a growing black power movement, there was a growing black nationalist movement, and these people had given up on nonviolence. I mean, they had given up on including white people, they would give speeches where they would talk about killing whitey, Malcolm X would like give press conferences where he would straight up tell people, yeah, you should start killing white police officers. And because of this existing concurrently, it was very important for Martin Luther King to stress nonviolence. Because remember, he's trying to sell this movement to white America, and they're getting anxious about all this kill whitey rhetoric, and so he had to just keep reminding people that they did not support violence, and that's because King correctly understood that he would need the support of white people to achieve the power necessary to implement the goals of the movement. But the problem was that towards the end of the decade, Martin Luther King was losing lots of public support because of the rioting in the cities, and also because he took a stance against the Vietnam War, which, like all anti-war rhetoric from the left, was because of communist sympathies. This is why we're always scratching our heads. We're like, uh, the left used to be anti-war, and now they're pro-war, <laughs> hypocrites, and it's like, bud, listen up, dear guy. Anti-war was always about pro-communism because the communist activists wanted communism to spread throughout the world. And this is not to take a stance on the Vietnam War or the domino theory or anything like that. It's just to correctly point out the motivations behind these demonstrations. Like the useful idiots are always gonna believe that the true cause is whatever is printed on the poster, but it's never that simple, of course. Moreover, uh, towards the end of the decade, he had transitioned a lot of his rhetoric from anti-racism rhetoric to anti-inequality in general, meaning in terms of economics and wealth, things like that, anti-poverty. 
And there was an anti-poverty march planned for the summer of 1968 that was predicted to be a total failure, that was predicted to end up devolving into a riot. But by that time, by the time it would occur, MLK had already been assassinated. But to summarize, by the end of his life, Martin Luther King was in support of reparations for black Americans. He was in support of affirmative action. He was in support of changing the federal government to essentially redistribute wealth to non-white Americans. And the whole anti-poverty march that was planned for the summer of 1968, it was about exactly that. It was rooted in identity politics against white Americans, and it was going to levy all of these demands against them. And that's why it's not enough to say, oh, well, but King said there was work to be done in the black community. Yeah. Yeah, remember, he was trying to sell these ideas to white America, so he couldn't just say everything out loud, right? Like he had to dress it up like, well, we just want equality, and then don't you worry, we're going to take care of the rest. But of course, it's never that simple, is it? He was also in support of racial quotas in the workforce. Basically, anything that you can think of in terms of the racialist policies that we see now, he would have gone on to support, 100%. And we know that not only because of the rhetoric and the actions, but because of all of his protégés, all of his successors doing exactly that. But he never got to that point because he was assassinated, and as a result of that he's now seen as a martyr for the cause of civil rights. And every person in this country is told as a child that he was killed by a racist white guy because he was a hero fighting for good against a racist country. And this is the key to his story. And because the left can only function if they believe that they're in a perpetual state of revolution, they have to believe that he was killed by the power that they were fighting against, either because it was the power of white racism through a lone gunman, or it was the power of white racism occupying the FBI or the CIA or something that put the hit out on him. This is not the case. No, it's true that MLK was killed by power in this country, but it wasn't power that he was working against, it was power that he was working for. Because towards the end of his life, he was losing standing in the civil rights movement. His public popularity was declining, he began flirting with elements of black nationalism and black power. In his 1968 summer march, that was setting up to be a disaster, and so a calculation was made. Because the only thing more compelling than a revolutionary in the eyes of the public is a martyr. And so it was probably calculated that it would be better to take out MLK and cement him as a martyr for the religion of equality for the rest of time than it would be to basically let him fade away as he lost more standing within the eyes of the movement and of the public. Because without the assassination, he wouldn't have a legacy. And I guarantee you, he wouldn't have a holiday. He would have become someone like Al Sharpton or Jesse Jackson. Like eventually the information about the scandals would have gone public, his infidelity, his communist ties, his plagiarism. But now, because he was assassinated, nobody cares about that. Because the story goes that he died fighting for equality and he was killed by a racist white man. Like that cancels out any and all criticism. Like literally, BU admitted that he plagiarized his dissertation, but they still said that they weren't going to do anything about it. So in terms of the legacy of Martin Luther King, being assassinated, was like the best thing that could have happened to him, which I am sure he would disagree with. I'm not happy that he died at all, by the way, not only because it's immoral, obviously, but because I know that that was done to cement his legacy in American history as something that you cannot contest and that you cannot question. But yeah, like he would have become someone infinitely less important, like Jesse Jackson, who was one of his protégés. And he wasn't at all opposed to identity politics. Like Jesse Jackson's rainbow coalition, meaning not white coalition throughout the 70s and 80s, that was just the direct successor of Martin Luther King's work. And just like Jesse Jackson is the direct successor Black Lives Matter is the indirect successor. You could not demonstrate a meaningful difference between Black Lives Matter and the civil rights movement. And I'm serious about that. Like the end goals, the tactics, the narratives and ethos, it's all more or less the same. And the only differences would be minor things like Black Lives Matter is led by women instead of male preachers who needed to be male preachers in order to appeal to white America. So if it weren't for Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement, we wouldn't have Black Lives Matter. We would not have affirmative action. We would not have the levels of anti-white racism that we do now, certainly not within the predominant culture. You wouldn't have the restructuring of history to put non-white people at the center of it while minimizing the accomplishments of white people and demonizing them simultaneously, et cetera, et cetera. And you can thank the civil rights movement for that. You can thank the civil rights movement for the disasters that are now American cities. Go ahead. Ask your grandparents how nice it used to be to go into the city, to use public transportation, to use public facilities. They'll tell you. Conservatives, because they are addicted to losing, will say, well, the cities are bad because the Democrat policies and public transportation is bad and public facilities are bad because the gosh darn government, they can't do anything right. No, it's a bit more complicated than that. My experience at the post office, the United States post office, is a lot smoother in Democrat-run Vermont than it is in Democrat-run St. Louis. You can tell me why. And again, this is not to say that the activists did not have some legitimate grievances. It's not to say that we should just control Z this whole thing. It's just to point out that it is historically illiterate to celebrate something that has enshrined the riverbeds for the further destruction of our country. Like, who's better off because of this? No one. No one. 
No one is better off because of this. They're actually much worse off because of this, particularly black America. And it seems that the only people who've benefited from this are the people who orchestrated this whole thing in the first place, which are the people who pull the strings in the society. And just like they selectively apply the standards to punish American heroes like George Washington, they selectively apply the standards to ignore plagiarism, the serial adultery, the ghost-written speeches, all of the things that poke holes in their portrayal of Martin Luther King because it serves their narrative. Martin Luther King could not have done anything without their help. He did not write his speeches. He couldn't have done anything without the support of the press of the universities, of the elites, etc. Does that ring a bell? What have we been saying? Nothing ever changes and history repeats and we will continue to lose so long as we continue to take these people at their word, buy into their moral frameworks and somehow think that we can like outsmart them in doing so. It's impossible. Sorry, but Martin Luther King is a false idol. His legacy sucks. And everyone in this country is worse, worse off because of his efforts, especially the people who he claimed to advocate for and who supported him the most. Because it turns out that you can't actually trust people who make money denigrating and selling out the American people to advance the betterment of the country or its people. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on post notifications, and of course, share the video with a friend. This was fair, right? Like, you know, everything I said was true, and a lot of it you're gonna have to just do your own reading for. I mean, you know, when you're talking about things like history, it's not like you're making an argument necessarily. I mean, you're drawing from historical primary sources, and then you're using that to construct an argument. But the problem is that a lot of leftists now, well, all leftists nowadays, they are so source reliant because they're not capable of, um, you know, proactive thought and actual thought. And so what they do is they use sources like basically Pokemon cards. So you can't read from a source and infer a conclusion and use that to construct an argument. When a leftist makes an argument, their argument is the title of whichever article or study they're citing. And so they use it basically like a Pokemon card, like, oh, here's my study, here's my source, but they're not capable of actually independently processing material and coming to conclusions and things like that, which is of course why they're leftists because they are uh, highly subject to conformity. They lack, the, they lack the internal monologue. Sorry, I've been talking for a second. Talking for a second, it's my job, it's what we do. We talk and uh, we make points and many people are saying that they're some of the best and there's gonna be more, okay? More content is so imminent if you only knew, but yeah, I had fun, so thanks for watching. What's that thing I say at the end? It's been a second, hasn't it? Wow, look at that. Look at that. Haven't talked to you guys since I was 21. Now I'm 22. Look at my old age already getting to me. I forgot that thing I say at the end. Um, so that's right. Thank you so much for watching and may God bless America. Poof.